Yo, it's your boy, Nickel, bringing it to you here. Summary of science experiments. You guys just finished three science experiments, and uh, let's just quickly discuss what you should have learned from each of them. So here we have a coal. Uh, first, we're starting with a beaker that's in cold water. It has a balloon that is placed on it after it is put into the water. And the balloon just kind of flops over here and is just sitting on the beaker. Now, what we actually see when we add or we transfer that beaker to the hot water, is it that balloon inflates. And we saw that the balloon inflates because the air molecules were dense and compacted here inside of our beaker, and then they got more energy when they were heated up, and so therefore they expanded, or they took up more space because they were less dense. Um, when we started in the hot water, you have those molecules that are super uh, well, not super, but they're less dense, and so they're bouncing all over the place. And again, you put the balloon on the beaker here, and the balloon just kind of sits here because that is the state of the air. It's just trapping the air that is less dense than what we're not used to. And so then when you put it in a situation which it cools down, all of those water molecules start to clump together. They take up less space because they're less dense. And so what we end up seeing is that, in some cases, the balloon actually gets sucked inside because the amount of air, the volume of the air uh, decreases because you have all those air molecules clumping together. Um, in the water density column, when we have the least dense cold water on the bottom and our card is in between, it protects the mixing of the liquid. But what we find is that when we do remove the card, the less dense water stays here on the bottom I'm sorry, not less dense, but they're more dense. It's more compact, so it's more dense stays on the bottom because the hot water is less dense, and so it kind of sits on top of this foundation of dense water. But when you have the opposite of that, the dense water is on top, the dense cold water, the less dense hot water is on the bottom, so when you remove that piece of paper, the red actually goes up into the top, and the cold sinks down, because it's more dense. It's like putting a rock into the ocean. It's gonna to fall to the bottom because water is less dense than the rock. But in this situation, the hot water is less dense than the cold water. So the cold water sinks, the hot water rises, and we end up getting purple because purples, we'll call it. <laughs> Blackish purple. Because those two mix as they pass each other. Moving on to the pressures on. We put a card on top of a cup of water, Dixie cup of water, we flip it over and we realize that the water doesn't fall out, even though we might think, well, the water is heavier than our card or it's heavier than the air, but the card stays on. Hmm. Well, when we then poke a hole into our cup and we have a little tiny hole in the cup, um, water rushes out. So what we learn from this is that actually what's happening here on this cup is that we have air pressure that is pushing on the cup in all directions. You could tilt this cup in any way that you wanted and that card is gonna stay on the cup because air pressure is exerting a force in every direction. So therefore there's no motion. But when we allow the air pressure to not only push on the cup and on the card, well, I should draw it over here, to push on the card and the cup in all directions, we are now introducing a hole and the air can actually go into the hole, pushes the water out of the cup and pushes the card out as well. So the air pressure is what pushes the water, which then pushes it hard enough on the card. Here, this is what we would call balanced forces because there is equal force from every angle, but when we allow air to enter the cup and push on the water, the water then exits the cup. And we can prove that this is what's happening because now when we place our alien pink finger on the cup here, we see that, whoa, we rebalance the forces because the air can no longer enter the cup and it's still exerting force from every angle. But with our finger there, we're protecting the air and not allowing it to enter the cup. Low battery, not allowing it to enter the cup. So therefore, the card stays on again. So here you we're learning about air pressure and that air pressure is exerted in all directions and um, it actually has enough pressure to actually hold the card on the cup as long as there's no holes. We're learning about water density based on temp. Um, here, let's write based on temperature. And our first one, we're looking at 
air density or the compactness of air based on temp. All right, let's uh, take these conclusions from our science experiments and apply them to um, weather. All right, so here we are on science notebook page 21. And we're going to begin to connect those dots here. So again, this is going to be about weather, but as we talk about weather, weather happens in the atmosphere. So let's just quick record some information about um, the composition of the atmosphere. What are the things that are actually in our atmosphere? Um, so let's begin here by just writing the atmosphere contains just about, we're going to estimate our values here because there's some decimal points that can go on, but on average we have about 78% of our atmosphere is nitrogen. About 20% of our atmosphere is oxygen. And about 0.9% is argon. Now these aren't always the gases that you hear of when people talk about the atmosphere. It's usually oxygen and water. But this here is actually, these three um, compounds make up 98.9% of our atmosphere. Now, what we can conclude from this is that there's about 1.1% left over. So what is in that 1.1% of our, of our atmosphere? So let's add a little aside here that the other 1.1% includes the greenhouse gases let's fix this here i n c l u d e s all right got to keep some good notes there so the other 1.1% of our atmosphere includes the greenhouse gases, and those are the ones that maybe you've heard of, such as methane and carbon dioxide. But another greenhouse gas is actually water vapor. So I'm going to put a little star here to say that the other 1.1% includes the greenhouse gases, and this includes water vapor. Now, Water vapor, if we were to actually write the chemical formula for water, as we've discussed in class, that would be H2O. Now the two goes with H, meaning that there's two hydrogens connected to one oxygen. And to write it in the vapor state, since we can have water that's a solid, a liquid, and a gas, water vapor is discussing the gas state. So here in parentheses, we put a G there to just let, to let the, um, the reader know that this is a gaseous water molecule. So in chemistry, this is how we would write water vapor. Now, when we look at water vapor, we did a lot of experiments to really investigate what was happening as water changed from a liquid to a gas, or even when water was in the liquid state, but at different temperatures. So we can then create some diagrams to summarize what we've learned. And we'll call this the behavior of molecules. Now, when we talk about this, we're leaving it as the behavior of molecules, not just water molecules, molecules, because actually as we look at out there in the world, we find that molecules tend to behave similarly based on the amount of energy that they contain. Now, we typically call that the temperature, um, but when we look at water in the cold state, the warm state, and the really hot state, we find that the molecules act differently. And that's true of all molecules. So I drew three boxes here to illustrate the behavior of the molecules in, in a situation which is cold. We'll call this one warm, which is just in between cold and hot. And then hot. Now, when we have the behavior of molecules, when, let's discuss water molecules. We saw in the water density column, as well as the up, up, and away, that molecules tend to become more dense when they're cold. And so here, I'm going to draw some circles here that represent a molecule. And typically, when you have a cold, cold, cold molecule, it's in a solid state. So here, I'm going to draw a clump of these molecules that have some specific structure and shape, just like solids do. Now, all solids actually have a vibrational frequency. Um, so I'm going to draw some little lines here to show that those 
are like little tiny shivering cold molecules. As they start to warm up though, typically we see it turn into a liquid state in the warm, um, at warm temperatures when it's not too cold and not too hot. And I'm gonna draw circles here that take up the shape of my container because liquids always take up the shape of their container. And that's because the molecules now aren't stuck in really, really dense formation, but they have more room to kind of spread around. So I'm gonna add some little lines here to show that these molecules are actually in motion. They are vibrating much faster than the cold molecules. It's kind of like when we get warmer, it's easier for us to move and just be out there in the world and move around like a liquid. But when we're cold, we're more solid and dense. We stay in one spot. Now, as you add more energy to these molecules, we then interpret that as becoming hot. And these molecules get so much energy that they start to shoot around the container. And in this phase, we call this a gaseous, gaseous state, or one in which the molecules have evaporated or are now a gas. So here, I'm just showing that these molecules are bouncing around in all directions. I'm drawing these long lines behind them because they're kind of flying around, bouncing off all of the corners here. So this is why a hot item, like for example, steam takes up more space than a cold item like an ice cube. And why an ice cube has a specific shape and a warmer liquid like uh, water takes up the shape of the container. So if we then kind of summarize what's happening in our boxes here, we would say that the cold would be our most dense state. And so I'm gonna draw box around that as the most dense. And then as it heats up, we come over here and things get less dense. And so here I'm gonna draw kind of like a action lines around this, an action bubble here. And you can see most dense, less dense. We use most and less as things are more cold and compacted. We have more uh, density. As they're less compacted, we have less density. So in this state, when they're most dense, we actually typically have a high pressure. So if you can think of my pen as being like a scale and those molecules are resting on the scale, we would have more pressure applied to the scale because all of those molecules are together. So in this state, we would actually end up seeing high pressure. And in weather, that's denoted with a capital, typically block letter H. And when they're less dense, if you can imagine a scale being below those molecules, they would not exert very much pressure on the scale. So this is an example of how air molecules could be considered low pressure. And on a weather map, that's typically denoted in a capital block letter L. All right. All right, turning now over to page 22. Let's talk about what's actually happening and what we observe in weather because of that difference in density. We see that in these, our, our, we see in our experiments how the air behaves differently or the water behaves differently. But let's discuss it here in our backyard. So let's do a little heading here and let's call this one mountain weather. And I like to draw in my notes to make them a little more fun when I look back on them. So I'm going to turn all these peaks into mountains here because I'm talking about mountain weather. All right. So if you go near the mountains, like let's say we're up in Estes Park. Estes Park kind of sits in a valley. So I'm going to draw some hills here with a valley between it. And Long's Peak is one of the mountains behind Estes Park. But there's many other ones like Hallett's Peak and several others. Um, but I'm gonna draw those mountains then. They're kind of just off in the distance from Estes Park, which is down here in my valley. Um, so down in the valleys, we have you know our forests. And so I'll draw some trees here to help illustrate that this is kind of the hills. And then up in the mountains is where we have our Rocky Mountains up here. So I'm just gonna add some more art to this to really distinguish the fact that we have mountains and we have our valleys. So what we see is that in the early morning, after a long night of no sun, all of the air has cooled, but the air at higher elevations has actually cooled more than the air that is in the valley. Sometimes some hot air or some warmer air can get trapped in the valleys, but in the early, early mornings, when you go up 
to higher altitude, you'll see it's much colder. And so here in Colorado, we have air that moves from the high altitudes down into our valleys in the early mornings because that air is more dense. So in the early mornings, what we observe is that the cold, the colder, more dense, the colder, more dense air flows into valleys. And then in the late afternoon, after the sun has been heating up the land, what we find is that the land that's down lower in the valleys, that can kind of keep a trap and it can accumulate that warmer air. So as the sun starts to go through the sky and as it starts to set, it's not fueling that continual heating of the land. And as it stops heating the land, then that air has a chance to kind of clump together and it moves because it starts to be less dense. So what we'll say here is in the late afternoon, sometimes in the afternoon, but in the later afternoon after that sun's kind of heated up the ground, what we observe is that the warm, less dense, the warm, less dense air rises into la montañas, into the mountains. All right, so we find then in the early morning, it's going to be colder in our valleys. In the afternoon, you'll see dense air kind of shooting up into the mountains. And so this actually controls, or this is the typical types of winds that we see. We see wind coming from the mountains in the early morning, and it comes from the valleys up into the mountains in the late afternoon. So you can kind of predict where weather or how weather is going to be moving. Okay, now that we've discussed density, let's look at how air pressure is going to affect our weather. So in this portion, we're going to talk about something that is titled orographic lift. It also could be called mountain lift or um, the, the fact that when air lifts up over mountains, it gets forced into different types of air pressure. So what we need to draw is, let's say we're drawing the Rocky Mountains here, or an area of a mountain range that has a higher point, and then maybe there's some more mountains as it goes down. But we're looking at a cross section here. So we're looking um, across a long, long stretch of land where the mountains get higher altitude, and then they decrease. And what we see is that down here in the lower, um, lower altitudes, you might get some cloud formation that starts because of the moisture that's in the air. But as it comes here to the mountains, it has to get pushed up because it can't just run, it doesn't just run into the mountains. The mountains actually force that air to go up. And as it goes up in the, to the sky, we end up seeing that it goes into an area of low pressure. So if it's lower pressure up in the sky, that means that it's higher pressure down on the ground. And the reason that the air pressure is different is because there's less air on top of you as you go higher up in the air. There's less to be on top of you. As you go deeper into the air, there's more air sitting on your head. It's kind of like in a swimming pool. You get that high pressure when you go to the bottom of a swimming pool or a lake. So as that cloud or that those um, water vapor, cloud particles of, of water, they get risen up into lower pressure, they can actually start to form larger clouds because there's less pressure pushing in on them. And so... They start to expand, and we see that as air gets forced over mountains, we end up seeing a lot of cloud development as those clouds go higher and higher up. Now, when these, this cloud development happens, it typically leads to precipitation. So maybe the air down in the valley was more dry, or it appeared to be more of a dry day, or it appeared to be a nice day. When that air gets pushed up into the mountains, less pressure allows more cloud development. More cloud development leads to precipitation. So here we call this, since the wind is coming from this way and over the mountains, this is called the windward side. And the side without the wind, it kind of ends up on the other side where the, the um, weather is not moving, is moving to that direction. This is called the leeward side. So the windward side ends up being a lot more wet. And the leeward side 
as you might guess, might be is actually going to be more dry. And that's because as the clouds come up, they lose their moisture because it starts to rain as that lower pressure. And so we end up seeing that the clouds start to decrease in size and sometimes they just completely disappear. So the leeward side is gonna to appear to be drier because the precipitation has already occurred. And this is like the rain shadow because the air gets forced up to lower pressure, gets rid of the rain. The rain shadow means that it doesn't get as much rain. It's more dry and we're the leeward side. So this would actually be a good example of here in Fort Collins, we don't get as much precipitation as somewhere like Vail or even if you think about like Winter Park, which is just across the mountains from us, a lot of the precipitation falls up there in Winter Park, which is great for skiing and snowboarding. And then it is great for us too, because we get nice, beautiful, sunny days in the wintertime. Woohoo! Jump for joy. That's orographic lift. So there's one last thing that we need to add here to page 22. And essentially, since we see that, um, we kind of see it here in the orographic lift, but let's draw a infographic to kind of illustrate what would be predicted of precipitation or the amount of moisture at different elevations. So we'll draw a bar graph. We're gonna draw a mountain bar graph actually. A type of graph you've probably never heard of. We're gonna show that, we're gonna draw a mountain, the cross section of our mountain here to indicate elevation. Okay, so this is our elevation, this line. So this is low elevation, this is high elevation. We're just going to estimate here, but what we would see then is at lower elevation, we can draw bars that show the amount of precipitation that would accumulate at these different elevations. And we'll see that as the elevation increases, the bars are going to get taller. And the bars are getting taller because there's more moisture that falls at these elevations. The most precipitation is going to fall right there at the top. And then a lot of the clouds have actually lost their moisture. And so some of these bars on the other side are gonna be really small because there's no more moisture in the air. So I'll just kind of shade in the bars here of my bar graph so you can still see my elevation in the background. But we see there's more, more precipitation on the windward side, less on the leeward side. That's why the mountains always have more snow than we do down here too or more rain even. Okay. So we need to label our graph here. So um, let's say that the this is elevation. As elevation increases, um, this is also going to be precipitation. precipitation amount at different elevations. So we could even say that's precipitation um, and then the elevation is just the line behind it. So we can even label it like this, elevation. And let's label a couple of these to show that these are my precipitation. That's rain, sleet, snow, hail, all that good stuff. All right, so orographic lift is just this idea that Air gets pushed to lower pressure, more precipitation occurs, and that happens a lot here in the mountains. All right, that's page 22. All right, so that's like a summary of some things that you should expect to see and observe here in the mountains. But in general, let's just kind of do a final synopsis of what weather is. Let's define it and kind of discuss some of the terms that are thrown out a lot when um, discussing weather. So let's do a, a headline here to discuss or to title our page. weather. What is weather? Well, weather is the state of the atmosphere. So what's happening in the atmosphere? And when you talk about weather, it's not a general thing that you can talk about everywhere. The weather is this or that, but you need to talk about the state of the atmosphere, what's happening above someone's head at a specific location. and at a specific time. As we know here, the mornings can be cold. The mornings is a specific time. 
can be cold here in Fort Collins. That's a specific location. And throughout the day, like in the afternoon, the time now has changed, and now the state of the atmosphere has changed. It's a lot more warm. And if we talk about somewhere like Long's Peak, um, we'll talk about maybe all day the state of the atmosphere is colder than it would be here in Fort Collins. So that's how weather is, you know, we have to discuss it at specific places and times. So weather, okay. Let's draw a cloud to kind of help accentuate this here. It's good to have pictures so that it'll catch your eye when you're flipping through your notebook that this is our weather page. So there's different types of measurements. Let's just discuss those real quick and record what we can expect when you get a weather forecast. Types of measurement. One could be um, high and low temperatures. And these are what you all have been recording in your science notebook for the uh, Loveland, Fort Collins, and Long's Peak locations. So that's definitely an aspect of weather. The high and the low, the low usually happens at night and the high usually happens sometime in the afternoon when the sun is high in the sky or maybe just a little bit after it's high in the sky as it starts to go down. Um, another important measurement for weather is going to be the wind speed. And especially if you're a pilot um, or if you're putting fertilizer on a field or um, putting some pesticides on a field, you're going to want to know the wind speed if there is one because I'll blow it off of your field, but also the direction. You wouldn't want to put a bunch of fertilizer on your field and then the wind blow towards your house. That could be a smelly situation. Sometimes that happens when um, Greeley is west is east of us and when the wind blows from the east to the west we get to smell that kind of agricultural community that's directly east of us yummy all right so we have high and low temps wind speed and direction um, another important measurement is humidity and let's discuss let's just define that real quick that the humidity is simply the percentage of air that is around us that is made out of uh, water or that has water vapor in it, the percentage of air that contains water vapor. Or maybe a better way to say that is the percent of water vapor in the air. So if it's 100% humidity, then 100% of the air is, or it's pretty close that it, the, the air is holding 100% water mean that it could essentially just be raining on you. That's typically what 100% humidity would be, is rain. Um, another important aspect or measurement is the dew point. The dew point is the temperature. The temperature that would cause the water in the air to condense. And if it condenses, that's when it turns, the water turns into a cloud. So our dew point is when the temperature, or it, the dew point is the temperature that would cause the water in the air to condense. Um, so humidity tells us how much water is in the air. The dew point tells us the temperature at which that water would then become a cloud or potentially rain. And so sometimes, you know, when we get fog on the ground, that means that the dew point, the temperature at the ground is actually the temperature that allows the water in that group of air to turn into a cloud, and that is our fog. All right, I'm gonna start underlining these measurements just to bring attention to those. So we have two more. We have high and low temps, wind speed, humidity, how much water's in the air, the dew point, the temp that would cause the water to turn into a cloud. Um, we also have wind chill, which is an important measurement, especially in the winter time. And the wind chill, if we define that, is just the temperature it feels like when the wind is blowing. And our last one is the barometer. And this one is actually a really important measurement to start to look at for a specific location if you want to really get to know the weather of a location because 
This ties back to our mountain weather page and how clouds can form in lower pressure. So if you know the pressure of where you are and you notice that it gets lower, you can actually predict that clouds are gonna form maybe even some rain. So a barometer is just a tool and it's a measurement for measuring the air pressure. Let's just write measures air pressure. And that's in inches of mercury, or it's also um, measured in And barometer is measured in many things, one of which is inches of mercury, which is I-N-H-G, I believe is what it is. All right, so here's some typical types of um, measurements that you get when you have different types of weather. These each describe a different aspect of weather. Um, and hopefully now this kind of gives you a good summary of what in the complexity of producing a weather report and understanding what's happening in a specific location. All right, nickel out. Peace.